Welcome to another episode of Blue is the New White. I've got a very special guest here today uh, that a lot of you probably already know. Uh, his name is Danny Kuntz with the Collier Restaurant Group, uh, Facility Director, right? Director? Yes, sir. Yeah, Facility Director for Collier Restaurant Group. So uh, I'm very excited to hear uh, his story today and how he's navigating these waters of uh, the current mm -hmm. economic and social climate. So, Danny, without further ado, why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience, man. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, yes, sir. My, I'm Danny Kent. I am the Director of Facility Management for Kari Restaurant Group. <clears throat> Since uh, November of 2016, the bulk of my career was spent uh, probably at Ruby Tuesday at 35 years of managing facilities for up to at one point over 900 locations and uh, left Ruby Tuesday in 2013, did a couple jobs on the sales side and liked the facility side better and went back to it. So now I'm managing uh, Four Collier, which is a very small family owned company up just outside the mountains of uh, Great Smokies outside Knoxville, Tennessee. Very cool. Um, so tell me, you know, and go back as far as you want, but how did you get started, uh, in this, in this industry? <laughs> it's kind of funny. I was, um, uh, was actually working at Pizza Hut and <laughs> got tired of the Friday, Saturday night thing. And a friend of mine said, Hey, I work at a commissary for Ruby Tuesday. And I wasn't even sure what a commissary was. And so we cook food and load trucks for their restaurants. They had like seven and said, hey, do you want to go to work there? And I said, sure, Monday through Friday. And she said, yeah. I said, can I go to school and then go work after class? She said, yes. And I said, okay, great. Get paid every week? Yeah. Checks clear? Yeah. Okay, good. So I started doing that while I was going to the University of Tennessee. And about three years in, they came and said, hey, would you like to stay when you get done with school? And I said, like forever? And he said, well, you know, whatever forever means. And I said, yeah, why not? What do you want me to do? He said, well, you want to be the purchasing guy? Yeah. What do you want me to purchase? He said, you know, equipment, small wares. So, okay. He said, you know how to do it? I said, how hard can it be? You just make a deal, don't you? I mean, it can't be that much. And he said, okay, you're the purchasing guy. So, all right. So I started doing that for a few years. And they came to me and said, hey, we're, we're starting to build some restaurants here. We need somebody to manage the facilities. Will, will you take it? I said, well, what about my current job? I said, well, we'll just add it together and you do both. So, okay. You know anything about facilities? No. I know that you call somebody and you figure out who you need to come and do the work and you figure out what it should cost. You know, I'll, I'll figure it out as time goes on. They said, okay, you're it. And, and so then I had 35 years there. So, you know, I guess it was a good thing. I was the only facility director they ever had. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but they didn't know any different because I'm the only guy they ever had. So. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. That's a, that's a great story. So, uh, so then did you, what did you end up going to school for? Uh, just basically business, general business. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, the opportunity was there. It was a very small company that was kind of growing you know, a little bit, I saw the opportunity and, and I liked doing, you know, the things that I was doing there. And so just started working there and then stayed for, like I said, 35 years. Unbelievable. That's, that's, that's fantastic. So, um, you know, before I get into, uh, the, the meat and potatoes of the questioning, I'm curious, what do you, what do you like mo most about the facilities management facilities directing, um, industry? I, the opportunity to help people. I mean, when, when you're in facilities, people are calling you because, you know, they have a problem and, and something's not working right or they, they have an issue and they need your help. And, and if you have the ability to help them, whether it's helping move a vendor along, picking the right vendor, uh, managing the call to make sure it gets done correctly and for the right price, anything you do like that it frees them up to do their job, which is to take care of the customers. And, you know, a long time ago, I learned from Ruby Tuesday, just kind of a saying that, that people had there for a while. If you're not serving the customer, you need to be serving someone who is. 
And, and so I always took that as that was my job. I was not serving the customer directly, but those managers and those people who work in the restaurants are serving the customer directly and I need to be serving them. So I, I think it's that just the ability to help people. That's fantastic. And you know, <clears throat> that's a, uh, um, narrative that I hear quite a bit. You know, I talk a lot about the skilled trades and, you know, that's basically what the the podcast revolves around uh, in, in a normal day and age, you know, and, and obviously my book and everything else. And uh, that is from tradespeople, from facility managers, from, from so many people that I talk to, the number one thing that they love about their job is the ability to help people. And I just think that that's, sure that's remarkable because when you, when you talk about facilities management, you know, first of all, I don't think any high school kid out there really knows what facility management actually is. Um, Same thing with the skilled trades. You know, I don't think they, a lot of them know, you know, what plumbers actually do or what HVAC technicians really do, you know, on a, on a day-to-day basis. Um, So let alone uh, understand the, uh, the thought process of, um, how many people you can actually help in these positions. So I think it's remarkable, you know, that, uh, uh, that you say that, uh, especially for the facility management field, it makes so much sense. Sure. So um, let's talk about kind of the state of the industry right now. Um, first off, have you been through in your, in, in your vast experience in the industry, have you been through anything like this before either, you know, 2008 or, um, you know, uh, nine eleven or anything like that. Have you have you seen this in your current position before? Well, I mean, nine eleven was really quick. You know, the thing about nine eleven was it was stopped and and for a few days, and then as as things go on and everybody kind of knew what to do to get back up to speed, things got back to relatively normal pretty quick. You know, two thousand eight. That was tough. And um, at Ruby Tuesday, we were probably on the front side of doing a complete makeover for restaurants. And the makeover was going to kind of be to take it up a notch. Uh, You know, well, you're taking it up a notch at the same time when the economy is going south. And we were probably 25% into it and done when that happened. Well, you you're you're in no man's land you can't really stop you got to keep going and that and that's very difficult and and then when we finished it we got it all done but when we finished it the problem was I'm not sure the customer base ever bought it and then you lost some of your existing customer base because they they didn't care for what you'd become they liked what you were before so you got double whammied and you lost customers and you didn't guess necessarily gain new customers at the same time. And, and it was tough for a while, you know, kind of made you rethink what you were doing. And so you were just, you were stuck. I mean, you're, you're kind of, you're so far down the hole, you got to keep going. I mean, you got to finish. And it, it turned out to be Uh oh, did I lose you? Oh, there you go. There, there you are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, so I bet that was tough. Um, you know, in that uh, in that economic climate. So, how does how does that um, compare to what you're seeing today? I think what you're seeing today is is one you don't you don't necessarily know what to do and and so everybody's kind of waiting to try to figure out and you know if you're on the facility side and and you're on the side of the of the business that I'm in, lots of folks are not working right now you know um facility management's not necessarily considered you know a critical core that you got to keep somebody on the payroll. So lots of people are getting furloughed, laid off for a period of time uh, to see. And so it's really tough. And and then that affects other trades. You know, your, your equipment industry is affected. Your food distributor network is affected. So, I mean, 
But when the restaurant industry is kind of shut down as it is, you're affecting not only restaurants, but other companies and other trades, you know, your service providers, there's no work for them to be done either. So it's a, it's a trickle down, which kind of affects everybody. And the problem is you don't know how long it's going to last. And, and so you don't want to, you know, try to bring it back too quick by the same token. You don't want to wait too long. It's a, it's a guessing game. And that's what makes it really tough because nobody really knows how to plan. Yeah. Yeah. Fear of the unknown, you know, and I think that's the nail on the head right there is that, you know, this would all be a lot easier, I think, for everybody to handle, even if we had an absolute end date, you know, but, and we have a, a, you know, an April 30th kind of end date, but still no one really knows if that's going to stick or if it's going to get pushed or, you know, or what, it's this great unknown that everybody is, uh, is in right now. And, um, you know, and it's interesting that you said that, you know, the trickle down effect with how many different companies this actually affects, because, you know, I kind of see the, the restaurant a- industry as a nucleus for, for a lot of the different trades that are out there. You know, I, lo- I know that a lot of trades specialize in restaurant equipment repair or HVAC or, you know, parking lots or whatever, whatever it may be. And, you know, they have their, their niche, their specialty you know, us being one of them, um, you know, in, in, in what we do for restaurants now, you know, wow. we're, we're kind of lucky cause we have a big group of quick service restaurants. So their, their doors are still at least semi open. And, you know, I think it's important to note too, right there that I've heard a lot of people say, Oh, well, you know, restaurant sales, uh, for carry out and delivery are going to go through the roof, you know, because their dining rooms are closed. And I, I want everyone out there to know that that's not the case everybody out there is down, whether they specialize in dining or carry out or drive through or delivery, it doesn't matter. I think everybody on the grand scale is down. So I think that's just, you know, important to, to let everyone know that. We we tried to go and take out in some of our locations. And again, we're in a tourist market and there are no tourists. So obviously you're, there's not a lot of people doing takeout and to go, but we're not looking at it as money. If we could just cover the cost of the people who were doing it, you know, basically break even, no, no profit, just break even just to be able to pay the people who were doing it. We would have been thrilled Now we weren't able to do that, but yes, everybody is way down. Take out for most, most folks or drive up is, is a part of their business quick, you know, fast casuals, you know, a little different. They have, more drive through than most places, you know, but for any chain top restaurant or anything like that, it's, it's a very, very small amount, if at all. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, so how has this, uh, how has everything that's been going on, you know, affected you uh, personally, you know, as far as your position as a facility director? Well, I'm, I'm like many others. I'm on temporary furlough. Uh, for a period of time because we have no restaurants that are operating right now. And again, as I said before, we're in a tourist market. So until the tourists come, which is probably going to be June, you know, maybe even July, if they wait till June to book, then it's going to be July. So during that time frame with no restaurants, you have to look at essential employees, you know, and obviously you want to help hold on to your management teams as best you can in the restaurant and some of your payroll people, you know, that pay the bills and things like that. Everybody else kind of becomes like in my case, you don't have any properties open. So it's not necessarily critical that you're there. So, so you're asked to take a few weeks temporarily, you know, off and then see how it goes. You know, that my company applies for the small business loans and some of the other things. And, help protect payroll. And if all of that happens, then, then odds are, you know, I'm going to be going back to work pretty quick, but nobody really knows. So, so then yeah. it just becomes, you know, do, do you look for something else? Do you wait? If you wait too long and it doesn't come back, you're, you're behind the eight ball because there's several other people, you know, out there doing the same thing. So it's tough. It's again, there's no, there's no map or anything that kind of says, okay, do this, do that. So uh, I put, I just put a note on LinkedIn that I would be temporarily furloughing and 
you know, hope to be called back. But if you had anything short term or a, maybe even long term, depending on what happens, I would be interested. Look, really had not pursued that much because I don't want to. But as time goes on, if it looks like, you know, it may, it may be longer than anybody thinks, then, then you've got to, you have to feed your family. So you have to start looking and seeing. But I didn't want to do that right out of the chute because I didn't want people to help me or offer to help me with another job or another opportunity and then go back to work in two or three weeks and waste their time. That, that didn't make, doesn't make any sense at all. So now it's just a guessing game. You know, what do you think is going to happen? When do you think it's going to happen? Can you do that? And there's lots of people besides me that are, that are in that same boat. They're on laid off or on furlough for a period of time. And then they'll see what happens when that time's up. So, yeah. Yeah, back to that great unknown, right? And that's yep. uh, it just uh, the hardest part through all this is is not knowing what to make uh, a decision on and why, you know, because it's mm-hmm. just hurry up and wait, you know. And sure. Um, so that's that's interesting. So what are you what are you doing to to fill your time right now and the the, the newfound time that you do have? Because we all know that facility managers aren't really usually accustomed to free time. Right. A uh, couple things. One, I do things like this with you or, or talk to people. I am heavily involved in the Restaurant Facility Management Association, uh, and I am uh, currently working on some things with them, helping out, uh, have some time. Um, I'm in a group that is uh, interviewing for our new uh, chief executive officer position. She is retiring, and uh, – so I'm on a committee that is uh, doing the interviewing and so on for the person that will take her place. So that's, that's part of it. Uh, learning how to kind of interview up, if you will, you know, cause we're interviewing a CEO. Well, you don't, if you're a facility person, you don't normally interview up, you interview even or down, not, not up. So not only are we doing interviewing, but we're learning how, to interview that particular person. So trying to stay busy with that and then just, uh, you know, kind of continuing communication. Still have my email for the office if there's anything that comes up that I can help with or anything like that. So trying, but it's it's a different world. You know, your phone's not going off every few (laughs) minutes and everybody says, well, that's great. Well, it is for like a day or two. And then after that, it's kind of like, Oh, this is really boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get so accustomed, right? And I don't know yeah. about you, but uh, I call it the phantom ring, right? And uh, I, I, if I take time off or, you know, if I don't get calls for a certain amount of time, I swear I'll hear my phone ring and it yeah. won't actually be ringing. Or if it'll be in my pocket, I'll feel it vibrate, but it won't actually be vibrating. You know, exactly. I don't know if you're, you're thinking, you're feeling any of that, but I certainly understand how, how much of a change of pace it is, you know, for yes. somebody in, uh, in your position. So, um, so l- let me ask you this, how do you, and, and I understand that because of all the unknowns, this is going to be nothing but a prediction for, for anybody, mm-hmm. but how do you see this rebounding? You know, do you, do you see a, a, a wave of, uh, you know, of customers back to the restaurants and, and again, that trickle down effect, you know, trickling into all the vendors having so much work and being overwhelmed, or do you think this is going to be kind of a, a slow transition back into operation? Well, I think two or three things. I think customers are going to be ready to get out of the house and they're going to want to go and they're going to want to get to the restaurants and go. Now the problem may be the, the customers are going to be in the restaurant at bigger numbers than you're able to restock and, and rehire, you know, because a lot of your hourly folks uh, are going to go somewhere else, you know, or, or something like that, because there's other opportunities, you know, like grocery stores or things like that, where people are just hiring, you know, as many as they can get. And, and so some people may transition to that and may say, hey, I'm fine where I am. I don't want to come back. So you may have a more customer push that, that will happen so quick that the restaurants may not be, you know, back to full staff or ready. I think for your vendors, it's going to be, you know, the rush to get things fixed and up and running is going to be quick. I think for companies who sell equipment, that's going to be a little longer. 
because people want to see how's cash flow work and, and what's going to happen. So I don't see that coming back as quick. Food, food distribution network will be good. Uh, for the facility manager side, hopefully, and what I'm hoping for is as we get ready to start reopening restaurants or redo restaurants or whatever we may choose to do, that I become in demand very quickly. You know, from being out of demand to we're going to open all these restaurants back up in seven days and you need to go to work and, you know, to do that. And hopefully that's it. I think it's also a good time from a facility manager standpoint. Maybe one of the things I'm going to do, hopefully when I go back is I'm going to look at all my deals I, and I'm going to sit down with all my vendors and, look at the deals we have and see, can I tweak them? Can I do something? Um, I've changed some, you know, I have full service contracts on HVAC and uh, equipment with two different companies. Well, I put, I've suspended that for 60 days just to sit because I don't have anything open, but I want to take a real long look at it. I still think it's a good idea, but I want to go back to it and, pursue it again and make sure I'm doing the right thing or what other opportunities are out there with vendors who, who are going to want to hang on to everybody that they had previously. So not trying to take advantage of it, but can I strengthen the deal? Can I become a better partner with those vendors? Are there things that I should have looked at or need to look at now going forward? You know, for instance, just thinking about seems you see a lot of things that come up through your LinkedIn and through email and that's along lines of plexiglass, you know, at the cash out stand or this, or that, well, is that something that's going to become the norm? You know, is that the way it's going to be moving forward? You know, do I need to look at something like that? Uh, those type of things, you know, what are my 10 kind of checklist items for ways to save money? What, what, what have I had in the bank? you know, that, that I haven't pursued that is an opportunity to spend a little, but save a lot, but because, you know, finance folks are going to be looking for opportunities to save and, and what do you have and what are those type of things? So, so I think for the facility folks, you know, if they do get called back to their job, they're going to be in heavy demand really quick. You know, do you remodel some stores? Do you do some things that you've thought about doing for a long time. Do you, you know, on the company side, do you go renegotiate some leases? Because those may be wide open to be renegotiated now that they weren't before, you know? So it's a whole really good opportunity just to kind of look at your whole, whole portfolio. Where are you and, and what could you possibly do? Because I think everything's going to be on the table. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that you put that perfectly, um, you know, because it's, I talk a lot on, on this show and, and, you know, with the people that I, that I speak to even outside of this show about the opportunities in this and about seeing the silver lining about using it as an opportunity, you know, as an opportunity to improve yourself, your operation, um, you know, the people around you, you know, because that honestly, you know, we can't, all just be down in the dumps about it. You know, we have to look for, for that opportunity. And as, as guilty as it makes me feel sometimes when I say it, we have to find the good in the situation. I know that the situation sucks for a lot of people, you know, and a lot of businesses, a lot of companies, and it's certainly not good. And I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But, uh, you know, from a mindset perspective, you know, we have to be able to, as a community, you know, as humans, you know, we have to be able to, to find a way uh, to keep that mindset, you know, on the right track, if you will. Sure. I, I, I think, you know, you have to look at it to your point. It's tough for a lot of people right now. I'm one of those people, you know, but by the same token, I, I'm looking at, I think I got a skill set, which will help lots of people if that opportunity is there. I'm hoping it stays with Collier. We, we both want to see the same thing happen. I hope that's what it is and that we're able to come out of this stronger and, and maybe with a, a do over is probably not the right term, but you know, to do some things differently and, and come out on the other side as a different company doing some things that we've always wanted to do a little differently, maybe not as fast, maybe not as big, 
you know, who knows, but, but better in, in some ways in which we operate. And, and if, you know, push comes to shove and, and it ends up being tough for car, then you got to go to the, you got to go look for what are your other opportunities, you know, but people do that all the time when things are, are good, not as drastic as now they're, yeah. they're looking for opportunities and you have to do that because you have to try to stay positive and, and look, it is tough and it's, you know, it's very difficult right now for lots and lots of people. And, and you just hope those opportunities come back and you have the ability to contribute. Yeah, absolutely. From both a, a professional and a personal standpoint, I think, because, you know, uh, at least, you know, for me, this was a huge eye opener, you know, not only professionally, but personally, because, you know, and I know I was one of many companies out there that we were cruising right along in 2020. You know, we were, you know, business was good. Everything was great. Finally felt like, you know, we, things were coming together and, and, uh, you know, we weren't switching software this year. This was going to be yeah. the, you know, this was going to sure. be the year that we, we you know, really smooth things out. And then something like this hits and it really makes you take a step back, you know, as a person and, and look at your surroundings, look at what you're spending your money on, look at how much time you're spending with your family. You know, it reminds you, I think, what, what's really important, at least if you choose to, to see it that way. And that's sure. the key, right? You, you have to choose to see it that way. Um, but I think, I, I think if, if enough people do, you know, they can use this to their advantage by saying, all right, you know, kind of hit the reset button on myself, on my life. These are the things that I was taking for granted before. And these are the things that, that I now see are, are more valuable than I, than I once thought. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, it, it's a way to look at it. It's a way to help you stay on plane through this whole thing. Because again, like, like we talked about before, you know, so I'm sitting around the house and not a whole lot to do and trying to catch up on some reading or doing some things that I never have time to do short mm -hmm. of being on a plane. So, okay, well, I can read some and I can do some other things and, and you know, that I haven't done before. And then already thinking ahead of, okay, well, not if I get called back, when, what am I going to do when I come back? Okay, I'm going to do this, and this, and this, you know, and, and that just, that helps you get through every day, you know, as you go along is the mindset of when the time comes, here's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And so kind of back to the, the facilities portion of it. Um, do you have now, now, answer me this when you uh when all your restaurants you know you, you guys made the decision to cease operations in this time mm -hmm. um did you go through any particular uh you know special uh hibernation or shutdown procedures for for any of the equipment or or you know the buildings of any kind no not not really i mean you just you you preset your air conditioning to a certain temp so that you know it'll just stay um obviously you're moving food around uh you know, to other locations or to your employees. A lot of ours, we just gave away to our employees um, who were losing their jobs because they needed it. Um, you, you do a few other things, you know, water heaters, you know, if you're not going to do to go or anything like that, you don't necessarily need, you can go ahead and kill your water heater. You can turn off all your pilots, things like that. Anything along that line. We didn't do too big a step because one we were going to have six or seven restaurants that were still going to do to go so they need to be up and running and we also i'm most of my locations are in a very small radius so they still had managers or directors who could go by and check them i have 17 restaurants in a 20 mile radius so it's easy so you can go by and check them periodically and so they were going to have once i was on furlough general managers or a director go into the locations every two days just to check to make sure so we didn't have to do a, a whole lot just a few things you know to help help your cost and so on you don't need all your lights on you need some of them on turn the signs off things like that just think sure. to save utilities more than anything else yeah that makes sense and and uh obviously everywhere is looking for, for any way, shape and form that they can, they can save as much money as possible throughout this. Um, so talk to me then about, 
uh, your plan for like starting everything back up? Do you plan to, to, you know, have your managers do it, do it yourself or have a vendor on site, you know, when you go to fire the equipment back up or anything like that? Cause we all know, you know, after a certain amount of time of not using something, whether it be a, uh, you know, an ice machine or, or a car, you know, mm-hmm. it, uh, sometimes it comes with its own set of problems when, sure. you, when you come back on. I, th- I think our, I think ours is going to depend on how fast do we come back. Mm. And, and I'm, I would bet we won't come back with all of them open on a particular day. I think we'll open two or three and then two or three and then so on. And if that's the way we go, then I, along with probably the director will be the ones that will be going to the locations to make sure everything's done and then bring in the vendors that we need, whether that's, probably somebody on the cooking refrigeration side, somebody on the HVAC side, plumbing probably, something like that, and bring them in to help us with that. But I think it's going to depend if we stair-step it, which is what I think will probably happen, That then that's easily handled as opposed to turning the switch back on to try to do 17 or 18 all at the same time. Because you'll, you'll run into more problems than you're able to address because – for your vendors, you know, you have to be conscious of the fact too that when our locations comes back, so does everybody else's. And the number of calls and stuff that they're going to get are going to be tremendous. And everybody's going to be want, why am I not first? You know, and and so I think you've got to do as much as you can on your own, and then you supplement that with their help only in the locations it's needed because they're going to be so, you know covered up with number of calls and so on to get people get restaurants open. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So do like a, uh, uh, a slow rollout kind of, kind of, yeah, that, that makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, to, to do it that way and keeps it in, in control. So you can control sure. your finances, you can control, you know, the speed at which it gets done and, and all of that, at least to the best of your ability. You know, Correct. At that point. So, well, and you're going to be bringing back staff at the same time, too. That's right. So, so if you control, nothing's going to be worse than opening too quick and having all your customers come in, your service be lousy, food's no good, something, you know, well, you're going to lose them right, right out of the chute. So if you stair-step it, kind of do controlled, you got a little better opportunity there to give them a good experience as you work your way, you know, through the system. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know about that. I think people are going to, people are going to be busting down their own front <laughs> doors to get out. I don't, they're not going to care about anything except for well, being out of their own be, house. <laughs> that may be true, but you know, you read online, like now you read about people who are doing to go and it's especially lots of restaurants who don't do to go very often. So they're really probably not very good at it and they're doing the best they can. And, and you see lots of people say, Hey, you know, just print positive stuff, but you'll still see the people who, you know, I had a terrible experience here. Yeah. Well, you know, they're trying. So yeah. you're still going to have some, some of those folks. So. Yeah. And that's, and that, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because I, uh, uh, one of the other things that I talk about in this, in this climate that we're dealing with right now is, is uh, um, everybody trying to practice empathy, you know, because there's, there's a lot of uh, you know, like, for example, your situation, you know, you, you were furloughed, right. And, and somebody had to furlough you. That wasn't easy for you to hear. And it wasn't easy for them to do, you know, you hear a lot of uh, uh, negativity going on online and stuff like that now saying, uh, you know, being all mad or whatever that they were laid off, you know, with, without the ability to understand why or how difficult it was for, for that company and not everybody, of course, but you know, I still see it, you know, and it still bothers me a little bit, you know, just because uh, to me, there's, I mean, this is affecting everybody. This is affecting the sure. entire world. So how anybody isn't able to understand, you know, certain situations and like you brought up the great example, you know, they, a, a restaurant didn't typically do carry out service. And, you know, so somebody's complaining about how the carry out service isn't great, you know, you kind of got to expect that, right? I mean, you, sure. you know, so that's, that's just my thought with it. Well, I, I, I would agree with you. It's not their wheelhouse. I, I try to put it in perspective. Like one of our owners was the, was the first person who spoke to me. And 
nobody likes to hear it, but I completely understood it. And, and I would have done the same if the roles were reversed. I mean, I would, you know, you, you have to look at critical. What do you have to have that's critical? You got to have a couple of people and somebody pay the bills and a finance person and, you know, a couple of your operational lead folks that, that manage a lot of restaurants and a couple of people in HR to help with all the unemployment claims and so and that and that's about it. Everybody else kind of becomes non critical. And and then if you really look at critical versus non critical, it's kinda of how it is. I mean I you know, again, I, I would have done if I if the roles had been reversed, I would have done the same thing. I didn't like it. And I hope to be one of the first people to come back, but, but I certainly understood it. You know, yeah. it's, to, it's business and, and, and you have to make those decisions and it's just tough. It's very difficult. It's hard. A lot of empathy for people that have to do that. You know, there's a lot of good people in our company that are sitting at home right now, but yeah. that, you know, you're hoping that it, as it, as it moves along, it starts to come back and everybody gets to go back to work and, things are good, but you know, th- yeah. there's no real reason to look at it negatively. It's, it's, it's business. It, it's just the way it is. It's business and, and it's everybody right now. And that's, sure. uh, you know, and the more people that we can have understand both sides, which I, you know, don't get me wrong. I think there's most people do, you know, most sure. people do understand uh, both sides and uh, uh, you know, but the more people that can, the better position that we'll all be in once this is all over. Uh, and we're all ready to get back to back to work, you know, no bitterness and, and anything like that. And I know I've, I've been in that position in my company and, you know, knock on wood, everybody that I've spoke to has also completely understood, you know, and, and it is what it is right now. We just, you know, we're all kind of in it together. Yeah. Sure. Um, and everybody's learning as we go because yeah. nobody, nobody has a blueprint for how to handle this. Nobody. And, right. and they don't know. And that just makes it harder. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. So what do you see? How do you see this uh, affecting the the future for uh, the facility management, you know, arena? Uh, I know a lot of restaurants out there may not make it through this, um, you know, as far, I don't know any numbers, percentages, nobody does, but I can only imagine that that some restaurants our restaurant groups probably won't be able to to weather the storm as well as others. Um, so how do you see the, uh, the facility management industry evolving after this? Well, I think, and it's funny because I just had this conversation with our facility management association of, as we are in a search for our new CEO, which, which I mentioned before, of what their first two to three years will be like. And we talked about the growing and so on. And my comment was, I think at least year one, and possibly year two, their number one goal is to hang on to the number of people that we have in the industry, keep them in the organization. Because what's going to happen is, is one of the things when people do get to go back to work, uh, lots of companies are going to look for opportunities to cut money somewhere. Well, conferences and organizations and stuff like that are one of the things that usually is one of the very first things that goes. You know, it's cut right out of the chute. So from a facility management association, one of the most important things is, as you are getting a new CEO, is to how, how to become creative into keeping those people, one, in the organization, two, the ability to come to your conference a year from now. You know, how do you do that? Do you help them with funding? Do you, you know, make some sort of deals or, or something like that? so that you keep those folks because they're not going to be the, you know, you're not the one deciding to go or not go. It's someone you work for who's going to be saying this has to be cut out of the budget and we can't afford, you know, seven or 10 people or whatever to go to the conference and that's got to be cut out. So you, you know, you're going to need to try to help that along. I think again, depends on size of the company. You're right. There's going to be some companies that are probably going to struggle or not make it out of this or, or at least come back as different companies, you know, maybe, maybe they planned on doing a lot of growth and that changes. Uh, maybe they stabilize and just take care of what they got. Other companies may use as an opportunity to 
get out of some bad deals, some bad locations, uh, cut your portfolio a little bit, you know, um, it's bad to say, but sometimes, you know, companies use it to do some cuts that they probably should have done already, but they didn't. And, and now they have an excuse for lack of a better term, you know, to maybe cut. Um, but for those who, who are out there in that market that do a good job and have done a good job for a long time, I think their opportunities, whether it's with their current company or it comes to someone else, is, is an opportunity for another company to strengthen what they have. Because there, be, there could be some really talented people on the market through their choice or through not their choice uh, that are going to be out there that other companies could pick up on or so on and end up strengthening, you know, their facility department. So it really just depends. I, it's going to be tough for some. may take a little while, you know, may, may take a little longer than, than most people like, but, but I think it's going to come back. You have to have folks to help manage your repair and maintenance programs. You, you just do. And it just may be slower. Than, than everybody's looking to. Yeah, no, and that, and that makes sense. And I, you know, it's funny you mentioned that uh, I didn't even think about like RIFMA, you know, and the, the associations being cut out. I know people are going to be looking to save costs. You know, I kind of anticipated uh, maybe, you know, PM programs won't come back, uh, right. you know, initially or, or even some CapEx uh, purchases sure. and things like that, you know, but I didn't even think about the the things like, you know, uh, the associations, the trade shows, the events, stuff like that, but it makes perfect sense. You know, everyone's going to be looking to recoup what they lost in any way, shape or form. And then you go back to, you know, is it critical? Is it critical? And of course it depends who you ask. Right. (laughs) But, uh, uh, but you're absolutely right. And at the end of the day, it really usually only boils down to one person or, or one board's decision. So, well, you're going to have things like travel get affected for facility managers, you know, who who manage lots of locations in an area, you know. Uh, they may be encouraged when they come back or to manage more remotely, which maybe is not something they've done. I'm not a real remote. I was, I was a look-see kind of guy. I want to go see it. Mm-hmm. I want to see the locations and see what goes on. I did that at Ruby Tuesday and do it now. Uh, but, but I think that may be a change for some folks too. If you've always managed by the look see program and so on, and now your new directions are you're going to go to the locations maybe half as often as you used to, something like that, you got to learn how to be more creative in how you manage and do it a little different way. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, uh, I did a, uh, a podcast last week with Terry Ubel of uh, High Hospitality, uh, also a RIFMA uh, member. And I've been working with Terry for a long time. And, you know, one of the things that he said, because he kind of brought that up too, uh, he said that, you know, uh, the best advice that he he got through this time was adapt. Everyone is going to need to adapt to their current circumstances, the future circumstances, because it is going to be, you know, kind of a a wave of change in the industry. And no one knows how it's going to change. They just know that it's going to change, you know. And so if you have an ability to adapt to your situation, your surroundings, your, your position, uh, whatever it may be, you know, now is going to be the time to, uh, to practice that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I've been waiting to ask you this and I really, uh, (laughs) I, I, I just, I'm curious if you have any advice out there for, for, you know, people in this industry, uh, doing what you do or who are in your, your current position right now, they've been laid off or furloughed or, um, you know, they're, they're, they're looking to something. Do you have any advice for, for people out there like that? I, th- I think one is, is to always use your network, you know, always use your network of people. And, and that's just reach out to, to anybody that possibly could help you. And, especially some maybe that you've helped in the past, you know, on the other side of the coin, but to just reach out, ask them, keep an ear to the ground, 
pay attention, if they hear anything, let you know. And then I think the other part is, is, is to expand or think about other things that you can do that aren't necessarily tied to what you're doing today. In, in other words, on, for myself, my facilities is, or facilities is my background for, for almost my whole career. But I've also done purchasing, I've done supply chain management, I've done distribution on the food side, all inside the career. So look to those opportunities as well, anything that you could have done in the past that may be out there as well. You know, just knowing that from the facility management side, it can be a slow recovery. Not sure how all that plays out, but what are the other things that are out there on a purchasing side, an inventory side, uh, like I said, supply chain management side or food distribution, anything like that, that, that's a management skill, you know, that you possibly could do to put out there and, and, you know, pay attention to those. What else is out there? Don't, don't necessarily just look at exactly what your core competencies are, but what else is there that, that you possibly could do or would like to do? You know, but first and foremost, I think, is use your network and, and talk to all the people that you know and inside and outside the facility industry. Because inside the facility industry, most are, a lot of folks are in the same place. So you're going to have the same yeah. conversation. But what else can you look to that might, because of this time or whatever, could be a growing industry? something that's going to grow and something that's not necessarily just needs people right now, but are going to need people down the road, you know, and, and look to those opportunities. So yeah. to, to help you, should you need them, you know, but reach out now and just have, you know, people kind of look and, and what else is out there. I think that's one seconds, you know, try to stay positive uh, every day and understand at some point this is going to be over going to come out of it really different you you said adapt i think that's critical you got to learn that how you've done business may not be the same when you come out on the other side of this maybe different i have different challenges um be ready for that be adaptable and and just stay positive you have to have confidence in your ability you know that, that i can make a difference somewhere and where that somewhere is, nobody really knows, but you'll, you'll figure it out. Yeah, that's, that's some really great advice. Um, and, and I agree with that a hundred percent. Uh, I think you put that very, very eloquently and, um, you know, and, and it, on the topic of using your network, you know, don't forget your vendors too. I know I've had a lot of people reach out to me, um, and you know, my ears always to the ground. And I, you know, the, your vendors a lot of times are kind of on the outside. So they're, so they're still in, in your industry, but uh, in the outside network of it. So they, they can see and hear a lot of the, uh, the things that are going around, you know, uh, on their end of it. Absolutely. Too, so, yeah. yeah I, vendors are a key part of my network because for a couple of things, one, I've been a partner, I've worked with them in the past or I currently work with them. So, so they know me and I know them and they also do a lot of business with a lot of other people and they know who's good at what they do and who might not be. Uh, so, so they have that ability to speak to other people as well and say, Hey, I know a guy or a lady and you know, you might want to take a look at them. That's how lots of folks, uh, get that opportunity, you know, is through their vendor network because the vendors know they, they, you line them up with all the people that they do work with. They'll tell you who's really good, and who's, who struggles, you know, and then they know, and nine out of 10 times they're dead on, but they just know. So they're, they're as important as inside your own network of people, you know, in the facility, in our case, facility management side. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, uh, Danny, I, I won't take up too much more of your time. I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sure. and sharing your uh, your infinite wisdom with with my entire audience. And I really think they're going to find a lot of value in it. So uh, before we hop off, why don't you uh, tell people you know where where they can find you um, or anything else that uh, that you want to add? Feel free to do so. 
Sure. Well, my email is still dkuntz at collierfoods.com. Still my email. Um, and then LinkedIn, you know, or any of that I'm on. And uh, just feel free at any point to, re- to reach out if there's anything I could ever do to help. I'd be more, more than happy to. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Danny, and uh, uh, good luck with everything. I'm, I'm hoping and I'm sure that we're going to be out of this uh, uh, pretty soon here. I think we will. Thank you for, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Danny. Thanks.